one. All right, welcome back everybody for the, uh, hey Ben, for the third installment of our series on the Brothers Karamazov. Uh, the first episode, I guess, was, uh, discussion would be a better word for it, was about the rebellion chapter. Last time we did the first part, we did like the majority, I would say like three quarters of the Grand Inquisitor. Mm. And this time we're gonna finish that up because uh, there's still a lot to uh, unpack. Uh, a lot that I listened back to what we said yesterday. And I have so much more to say on those same topics, but I don't want to like go over everything again. You know what yeah. I mean? So, so I'll actually, uh, just to get everybody caught up, we'll do a quick recap and then I'll send it over to you. Because once again, for you all dear listeners out there at home, this is his first time reading through this material. So we're getting a first impression. Um, so <clears throat> the parts that we've already covered, The Grand Inquisitor is a poem that Ivan is reciting to Alyosha. Um, he's never written it down, it's just sort of off the top of his head. And it's the story of Christ coming back during the Spanish Inquisition and the head of the Spanish Inquisition, who is the Grand Inquisitor, um, sees Christ, sees him perform miracles, knows that it's him, but arrests him anyway because he doesn't want um, any threat that a, a return Christ might pose to the orthodoxy and power of the church as he sees it. Um, and then he, when he places Christ in jail, he sort of berates him in a way, using the three temptations of Christ as as sort of a, a blueprint as to why Christ in the way he operated in his first visit was immoral. So he did not, this, this is the Grand Inquisitor's take on this, and therefore Ivan's as well, by not turning stones into bread, he asked people to be virtuous without having, um, what would you say, without ensuring the necessities for life so to speak. So he thought that that was one thing that was foolish. And if you want people to follow you, and if you're the way to the kingdom of heaven, give them bread and they will follow you. Um, and that went along with the miracle. Um, then he went into mystery and he used the second temptation, which was Christ refusing to jump off of a tall building and get caught by angels. So everyone would know that this is god incarnate and then follow him to the kingdom of heaven and the third one was rejecting um satan's offer to rule over all of earth in sort of like a, a caesar manner um caesar of the world and I, I would say maybe where we got to at the end of our last talk was that through the Grand Inquisitor, Ivan might be projecting to some extent his desire to unknow some of the things that he laid out in rebellion. Does that make sense? Yes. Like he, he wishes that there were a Grand Inquisitor who would be the dictator of all, or almost to some extent to be the catcher in the rye, to be the, the person who prevents human beings from figuring out the true nature of good and evil and thereby losing their the pleasurable innocence that he so yearns for. So that being said, I'll turn it over to you. First impressions of the the ending section of the Grand Inquisitor. Everybody's getting a little emotional, right? Like that's that's one. It's a little bit less. I, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know that if I could that I felt like anybody won this argument you know, or that landed it squarely in anyone's favor. But yeah. by the end of it, everyone's emotional, you know, which is yes, is a, definitely a distinction from what's come before it. Like everybody's a little unhinged by the end of this. Yeah. Um, oh God, so many things that came up in the second part for me that were like, uh, like I think uh, like the thematically what's being discussed here if you remove some of the um, sheerly religious context is like um, the certainty of some kind of reasonable outcome versus the notion that in a circumstance, um, one something should always be beyond one's reach. 
right? It's like the case for competition versus the case for, you know, some level of certainty or some level of equality of outcome. Yes. No. And yeah. Sorry. I, I just want to, I want to capture that point because for the AP students watching this, the point you just made sounds awfully Sisyphean to some extent. Like you're saying there, there needs to be something always out of reach. Um, we talked about this in class um, when we were doing Camus and The Stranger. We were talking about um, the absurd nature of human existence where we want answers to questions that we don't have the processing power to figure out. And because of that, we're absurd creatures. Um, and you run into the situation Ivan has run into where you push your reason to the limit. And it just so happens that that limit lands in a very negative place. But that's not to say that if that limit were to be extended, it would land in a positive place. And I use this example sometimes in class that <clears throat> the biggest flaw that I find in the game of basketball, this is going to seem like a weird little I love it. Trip, is that most, most games that are relatively close, it always ends up being just who scores last, right? They yes. go back and forth, back and forth. And if the game were extended by two seconds, the other, the other team might have won, right. right? And I think that's, that might be the metaphysical situation with how much existence there is and how much <laughs> we can understand it. It just so happens that given that that limit is what it is, you end in a very pessimistic place. But sure. maybe if we were like two steps further, the positive would win. Does that make sense? Completely. Yeah, it's almost like order of operations uh, with respect to the nature of consciousness. Yeah. Okay, so sorry, I just wanted to latch onto that because I like to tie all the books that we've read throughout the year together with the Grand Inquisitor with this ending part. So that's a little breadcrumb for kids to like, yeah. right? Um, people seek searching for something that's just out of what would you say? Out of our, out of the realm of possibility, right? All right, so go ahead, continue. Sorry. About that. I think it's worth sort of repeating um, a quote that we landed on last time, because as I as I finished his um, sort of uh, like presentation on on temptation, my my feeling about what the orthodoxy is saying here kind of shifted. Like my, my first reading through was that the orthodoxy was kind of speaking to the nature of power and sort of corrupted power. Yeah. You know, like uh, being this thing worth protecting and worth prioritizing over the, the miracle of Christ. Yeah. And in my second reading, I actually found that I felt like he wasn't speaking from power or, or malevolence, but what he was speaking from was like fatigue of duty. You know, he was kind of like, yeah. you know, it was basic. What, again, I'm tying, for me, the, the thesis of this whole thing is metaphysical substrate. That something is built on something else, that something is sacrificed for something else. And in this circumstance, basically, like, the orthodoxy is, is kind of claiming that it's like God projected himself on Christ. This Christ projects himself upon the, the church. You know, and in each each circumstance, the the next projection is the the person bearing the load, right? So it's Christ yeah. kind of coming back and being like, "Hey, I got some party tricks," yeah. and the church is kind of like, "No, actually, like we're the ones bearing the." And like, I love the example that he gives up here uh, that he gives here to to make it earthly with bread again, yeah. because for me, what I felt was, oh, like a a labor that's that's suggested in this is that we, we, we're baking bread for the poor, like in an actual oven, you know, like, and we're, we're dispersing it. And like, you know, the example that he gives, like what I kind of thought he was suggesting that that bread turns to stone was, mm -hmm. was literal, like, you know, like bread that was made to help the poor or to help the sick or the wounded, you know, yeah. it's stale and becomes worthless because of the challenge of actually serving these people in some, with some level of administration. Yeah. My mind just, blast it off there <laughs> um but the quote uh as we said last time 
Dost thou know that the ages will pass and humanity will pro proclaim by the lips of their sages that there is no crime and therefore no sin, there is only hunger. Feed men and then ask them of virtue. That's what they'll write on the banner, which they will raise against thee and with which they will destroy thy temple. Um, yeah, this, this, he begins sort of the treatise of like um, falling short of, of God, right? The sort of like, um, like if, if, we're, if we take you at your word, like, oh, holy one, like it was your, it was your choice here. Again, it comes back to that idea that like, um, if, if, you, if you're omnipotent and you could see how this all plays out, like you can see that the lion's share of your flock can't be trusted. Yeah, they're going to fall short. <laughs> fall short. So we're going to pick up the pieces and, and feed them bread. Right. Because they need, they, need, they need bread. <laughs> exactly. But to act like that wasn't like suddenly the, <clears throat> whose responsibility is that? You know, because it's like they can't be trusted yeah. to, um, to meet some level of uh, devotion. Yeah. Uh, or responsibility and also if anyone made the call here it's the heavens yeah. so it, like <laughs> this math in in the sort of like uh the mathematician that ivan is in this or the, the bargain maker he's like this this obviously doesn't check out right so all that being said right the grand inquisitor is making a very compelling point Right? Like, I, I can almost feel you when you're talking, understand it. Like, yeah, that makes sense. Like, you can't expect people to be gods. Right? Like, it, it, it's like you don't understand human nature. It, it's like God wanted to, to update our iOS. Right? Yeah. And so he was like, I'm going to show you the person I want you to be, right? If I were a person, I'd be this guy. So do that. And the Grand Inquisitor's like, your iOS doesn't run on my iPhone too. You know, like it, it, it's not possible. The, the apps are too complicated. Totally. Um, and then there's a weird... A weird move right the inquisitor says <clears throat> i'm gonna i'm gonna talk to all the people who know that you're christ because they just saw you like raise that girl from the dead and i'm gonna tell them tomorrow to kill you and they're gonna do it right because the the earthly temptation and the authority that he's taken that christ rejected is more powerful and that's what people want since they want what do they want? They want to be unconscious, he said. Right. Once again. And I, I think there's two things in that. Yeah. Like they want to sacrifice. Yeah. Well, the case he was making was that they want to sacrifice their freedom, yeah. you know, in, in the name of freedom, right? That like somehow the boundary produces the safety within which to uh, to improvise, you know, or or experience freedom. That there's actual like agony in a, a wider um like truly free sensibility and also i think i think what he's saying is like uh there's a quote from dan bihar one of my favorite songwriters and the line is um you can follow a salary to the bottom of the ocean i think what he's kind of suggesting here is like there's infrastructure that the church provides in this context too be it actual bread you know or the, the like um what comes with um, a, a pedagogical society, right? There's like, you know, he, he's suggesting all of order, I think, you know. Yeah, I will be in order. Want their careers or whatever, you know, it's obviously a different context, but they, they want what keeps food on their family's table, right. uh, keeps bread in their mouths, right. and they'll, they'll prioritize earthly, um, even like rationality, right? Over the miracle of this uh, that, you know, was apparently performed. Right. Okay. So this is, he's almost saying, 
my cold of personality, which but I'm using that term specifically because I feel like what he's talking about, Dostoevsky, what he's doing is predicting the cults of personality in the 20th century that we talked a little bit about yesterday after we stopped filming the video. Yeah. Um, like in the absence of something to believe in, something that feeds you, something that I think, what did he say, captures your conscience, that makes you feel like you're doing the right thing. Right. And you're on like a, a righteous mission. Um, and that which you can subordinate subordinate yourself to um an authority figure that is the cult of personality trifecta right it's like bread and circuses um make you feel like you're on a righteous mission mm -hmm. and give you like a father figure like yeah. old, uh, old poppy stalin you know that you can just <laughs> you can look up to right. um but what's funny, I think Ivan misses this, but Ayosha catches it, is that the cult, the, the Christian religion as Dostoevsky envisions it seems to me like it's also a cult of personality. But I mean that in a different sense. I mean, it's, it's not a rule-based system. It's a personality-based system. Because people think, people understand the world in terms of people and stories and personalities. This is the algorithm that when personified, you should organize your cult around, right? And that's the alternative to some extent. You follow the personality of Christ as something to be imitated, and that's the answer, right? Mm -hmm. So that seems to be Dostoevsky's belief. Then there's this weird twist at the end of the story where the Inquisitor, after telling Christ that he's going to get all these people who honestly believe in him to hand him over so he can be killed, um, Christ doesn't say anything, right? Do you remember what he does? The, the smooch? Yeah, he gives him the smooch. <laughs> and then... The Grand Inquisitor opens the door and is like, okay, but don't come back, right? Yeah. Which is interesting, right? Um, it's almost like he's saying, it's almost like he was moved by it. Do you get that feeling? Yeah. That he was moved by the fact that this guy who he just criticized everything about him, his whole mission, and said that I'm going to kill you even though I know I shouldn't kill you to some extent, like even though you're not really doing anything. Like he knows the whole truth. And he's decided right. to kill him. And still he kisses him because he's loving his enemy at this point. Well, dude, it's forgiveness again. It's yeah. the one, and now you suddenly have the one person who they've been kind of claiming at who might have the right to forgive, to be the mother to forgive her yeah. uh, her son's murderer yeah. you know I, I think it's also suggesting mystery too and this might be um some contemporary projection upon you know this this seemingly like curious gesture yeah. right like, By the way, just to cut you off i i would argue this gesture offers the miracle the mystery and the authority mm. that the grand inquisitor was looking for Right, but we have to pick this apart as to why, right? Right. So the miracle might be one kiss changed the Grand Inquisitor's mind about killing, like the power of forgiveness that you were just saying. Right. How that's the power to change a soul, a human soul with forgiveness is something most people aren't capable of. So to have that power is miraculous. Mm -hmm. The mystery is, well, how could someone forgive someone who wants to kill them for all the wrong reasons, perhaps? And, and how does that forgiveness have that power? And the authority is, well, here's the character of the guy who can do this. He has the authority in, in, in having the ability to forgive at such a high level that gives him the authority. Now that's a very classic tradition or 
Christian traditional interpretation, I would say. Yeah, but I mean, Dostoevsky shares that, right? Um, and I'm slightly running out of time, so I want to run ahead real quick, right? Uh, one, can I add one oh, ahead, uh, to the last part there? I think I think he's actually suggesting some Eastern thought here too. There's some like art of war going on with okay. this authority component mm -hmm. because like, you know, one of the famous quote in the art of war is like, he who, who like doesn't have to show up to the battle is the one that wins, you know? So yeah. like produ producing, producing authority, not by virtue of force, but the notion that like- By yielding. Yeah, exactly. It's very Taoist too. It's like- Big time. Yeah, like the the what was it? Like the image of the river and the rock. Yeah, and the river wins by wearing the rock down, even though it always yields and goes around the rock while the rock yeah. stands firm. Right, like that sort of idea. There's power in yielding. Um, and then, after all of that, the, the Ivan and Alyosha have a little a little talk about what all of this means. And then they go back into family stuff that won't probably make sense without having read the rest of the book. Yeah. And then he asks Alyosha a question, right? Yeah. And <laughs> he said, I thought this you were going away from here. I have you at last, or I have you at least, Ivan said suddenly with unexpected feeling, but now I see that there is no place for me even in your heart, my dear hermit. The formula all is lawful. I don't renounce. Will you renounce me for that? Yes. And now Yosha just gets, I mean, basically Ivan right there is admitting his full-on nihilism, right? Right. And everything, and everything just, that occurs is permitted. Right, yeah. Yeah. No rules, like none of this, like who cares about any of this at this point? Because if it's built on a, an immoral foundation, mm -hmm. everything built on top of that is questionable, right? So the whole house of cards falls down intellectually for him. And he's like, what, are you going to abandon me too, Alyosha? And Alyosha just gets up. I'm going to read the exact quote. Alyosha got up, went to him, and softly kissed him on the lips. That's plagiarism, cried Ivan, highly delighted. You stole that from my poem. Thank you, though. Right? And what's happening there, I think, is the part that always moves me the most. Mm -hmm. Because even in the story... Hello. Oh. It is after two. Um, we're gonna have to come back to this at another point. I got to go to my work meeting. I've got two real quick points. If you'll yield them to me, I need like thirty seconds. Okay. Um, the I want to mention that the contention he makes for the church uh, slightly earlier than this that the church um, like yields sinning to people that he like that, that it gives it. Oh to yeah, them. yeah. You know, like this is huge. He's kind of like, again, this is this is substrate. You know, this is this is uh, metaphysical substrate, and I think that's actually what's happening. I think what what Ivan is kind of doing, and perhaps we can break this down when we do another video. Yeah. But um, when Ivan is basically like, I, I'll I'll do this for you. Yeah. You know, he's kind of like he's he's suggesting substrate again and suggesting like that perhaps all it is is in this notion that like god projects himself on christ onto earth or you know some kind of creator projected himself into consciousness uh on a planet on an earthly plane mm -hmm. is like the best i can do is just kind of like like i did this with i'll do this with love for you because that's all, that's all I've got in this circumstance. Remember that. I'm glad I'm still recording because we can jump off from that next time. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I've got that lock. I guess I'll splice it together. I don't know how, how the hell it'll work. Who cares? Maybe we can just start from the beginning. I don't know. We can talk about this stuff all day. Um, yeah. But good talk, buddy. Okay, man. Yeah, um, let me know when you want to go again. Uh, sure. Later.